Almost. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and thank you for all of you who are joining us from home. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving and that you all got full bellies and full hearts. And uh, 
what a blessing it is, right, to spend that time with family and friends. And uh, maybe you're still awaiting that opportunity. Maybe you've got a Thanksgiving today to celebrate or in the coming week. Uh, and I just pray that that would be uh, replenishing and encouraging for you. And uh, as we get started today, I want to read a, a passage from Psalm 95, 1 through 7. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, and let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the, the mountains are his also. His hands formed the dry land, so come. And let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We give thanks for that today. Please rise and, and join us as we get started here. I'll say a quick prayer for us. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just, we do enter your courts. We enter this time, Lord, in thanksgiving in our hearts. And Lord, we just ask you to join us here. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to fellowship and have time, Lord, to worship in your name. And God, we just, we love you because you loved us first. And we just ask you to be with those who are traveling, who are not with us, who still have time to spend with friends. And, and God, we give you praise for the, the safe travel for those of us who have already done that and, uh, and been through that this week, Lord. And we just give you praise for all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Thanks for your help on that. Had it a little low, so glad I could hear you all singing there. Praise God. Psalm 77, 11 through 14 says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. For what God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. Our God is greater. Our God is healer. Our God is all in all. Let me give him praise for that today.
Praise God. Well, that'll get you going, won't it? Pardon me, I'm going to grab a drink. And those are the promises we stand on, right? That our God is for us, that our God fights our battles. And we can stand on that foundation. tries to roll over my bones When sorrow turns to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken be seated and kids can be dismissed to class. This morning as we turn to the epistle of James, uh, the bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will point out several problems with pleasures. Now, before you get defensive and, and uh, uh, resistant, you have to understand that pleasures are a two-edged sword, right? Pleasures, as we'll see, can be either a blessing or a bane. They can appeal to the best in us. They can appeal to the worst in us. So we're going to be looking at a couple of problems with pleasures. James chapter 4, verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. 
You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You know, wars and conflicts are often attributed to outward causes. Historians often attribute uh, the outbreak of World War I to such factors as alliances, imperialism, nationalism, militarism, international crises, and then precipitating events like the, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. Well, James would brush aside such explanations as, as too, um, uh, too simplistic, really. He, he'd, he'd sweep them away like the dust bunnies under your bed. He offers a more concise and universal explanation for wars and conflicts. And what James says here is true for nations, for families, for marriages, for other relationships. It's true in the home, in the school, in the workplace, and in the church. Now James raises the issue with a leading question. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Now that tells us first of all that quarrels and conflicts are prevalent. It's plural. Now we're not told what all is involved here but there is a significant amount of it going on according to James. It's unmissable and unmistakable. Quarrel is the word for war. Conflict is the word for battle, those individual skirmishes that together make up a war. The New King James Version has it as wars and fights. Wars and fights among believers. Now James may not tell us exactly what these quarrels and conflicts are about, but he does tell us the source of these quarrels and conflicts. Your pleasures that wage war in your members, that is, in the members of your physical body. In other words, external wars and fights are the result of internal factors, an internal war, the war going on within each of us. There's an internal war going on for control of us. Who or what will dominate our hearts? Who will capture the flag of our hearts? The war in our hearts can spill out and spread the misery. For wherever jealousy and selfish ambition exists in here, there is disorder and every evil thing out here. Wars and fights. Now what's waging war within? Your pleasures. Now these pleasures derive from the word that gives us the word hedonism. Unfettered self-satisfaction and self-gratification. It's always used in a negative context in the New Testament. The gratification of sinful desires. And for James, it's amazing the lengths people will go to satisfy their pleasures. Now, how does this play out? How does this manifest? How do these wars and fights break out? James says, you lust. That word for lust is, is a word that means strong desire. And that strong desire can be either good or bad. Desires can be good. Desires can be bad. As it's used here, it has a negative connotation. Now remember that we are tempted and carried away when we are enticed by our own lust. And that lust is the doorway to sin. Lust. When we are each individually operating on the basis of our lusts and desires... We're sowing the seeds of conflict between one another. Our lust, our desires clash. They come into conflict. Whose lusts, whose desires will prevail? That's the breeding ground for conflict. Now, despite this strong desire regarding your pleasures, James says, you do not have. The fulfillment of your desire, for whatever reason, is thwarted. And where does that leave you? Where will that lust, where will that strong desire take you now? Well, here's where the door to sin is opened. So you commit murder. Wait, what? The desire to fulfill your pleasures, that hedonism, remember that's uh, always uh, it has a negative connotation. That, that, that pleasure is so strong, that drive for that is so strong. You want it so badly. Pity the person who gets in your way. 
Your heart is so controlled by the enemy that you will do almost anything to get it, including murder. Murder? Murder. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Cain's unmet desire for that regard in here led to murdering his brother out here. The very first murder. King David, in the literal lust of his heart, commits adultery with his neighbor's wife. With Bathsheba pregnant and all of David's conniving to uh, create this aura of plausible deniability falling short, what does he do? He arranges to have uh, her husband, Uriah, killed. Murder. King Ahab, with that strong desire for Naboth's vineyard, uh, desires to acquire it, but Naboth will not give up the family inheritance. And so what does Queen Jezebel do? She arranges for uh, false witnesses to level charges against Naboth so that the city elders and nobles have Naboth taken outside the city and stoned to death. And now the, the vineyard is ripe for the picking. Murder. King Herod, after being visited by the Magi, looking for the one who was born king of the Jews, does what? He has all the newborns in the vicinity of Bethlehem under the age of two put to the sword. Why? Because he will have no contenders for his throne. Murder. The mob cries out to Pontius Pilate for the release of Barabbas and delivers Jesus over to death because of envy. Murder. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. Well, John, come on. I've never committed murder and never would. Not so fast. What if murder or the equivalent of murder was more involved than simply taking a life? What if it's deeper than that? What did Jesus say? You've heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. Whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Now there are two actions there, according to James, that we can exhibit toward others which the Lord regards on a par with murder and therefore... Uh, is its equivalent, even though no life is taken. Anger. Angry with his brother. That represents, according to John Stott, quote, unrighteous anger, the anger of pride, vanity, hatred, malice, and revenge, unquote. And that's certainly fitting with the tenor of James here. And hatred. Saying to your brother, you good for nothing, and you fool. Now, there's some uncertainty about what exactly those terms mean, but they are certainly expressions of deep derision. Beyond anger, this may get into the weeds of hatred. Anger and hatred. The point Jesus makes, as he does throughout the Sermon on the Mount, is that sin is the issue uh, of the heart. Murder is not just what happens out here. It's what goes on in here first. So, yes, murder. James is spot on. And in light of this, the question remains, what is the body count I have left in my wake as I exert this uh, pursuit of my pleasures driven by my lust? Churches and pews are filled with serial killers. Now, pressing on, James says, you are envious. Now, that's related to the word jealousy that we encountered in chapter 3. That derives from the word zeal. So this, again, is an intense driving desire. You see it, you want it, you have to have it. You're going to get it. And don't forget that that bitterness also attaches itself to jealousy. That bitterness attaches itself to jealousy. Bitterness is a wedge of separation between us. It's a source of conflict as it rises up in our hearts. Now, despite the intensity of this desire, James says, you cannot obtain. That road for you, whatever reason, has been blocked. Where does that leave you? Where will that envy, where will that bitter jealousy take you now? 
Well, pity the person who gets in your way. So you fight and quarrel. Now, we're back to the opening issue again, except this time the, the terms are reversed. Fighting and warring among believers. You know, the early church obviously uh, was not immune to this problem. The church at Corinth was so uh, divided among its, amongst itself that it was, it was having severe problems that were being manifested even as, as they uh, partook in communion together. And there were members in that church suing one another in the public courts before the Gentiles. Those in the churches of Galatia were apparently biting and devouring one another. What was going on in Ephesus that they had to be admonished to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace? Even the church at Philippi had two women who were at odds with one another and it was disturbing the unity of the entire body in Philippi. You know, the first time we meet James in the book of Acts, uh, he is overseeing a council in Jerusalem which is seeking to uh, respond to an issue that is causing great dissension within the church. You know, there was a time in, in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, a period of about 39 years in the late 1300s and early 1400s called the Great Schism. Uh, there were two competing popes over the church, one in Italy and one in France. Now make that three competing popes before the schism was ended and the Roman church was once again under one pope. And then there were the literal wars that broke out in Europe after the Protestant uh, Reformation of Catholics versus Protestants and Protestants versus Catholics and each one seeing the other as heretics going to war against the others, persecuting and putting them to death. Fighting and warring among those, literally among those who claim to be followers of Christ. It's nothing new. What is to be done? Well, we need to turn the tide of battle in here. What is the status of Jesus Christ in my heart? Did I confess my faith in him? Was I baptized into him? Is Jesus the Lord and Savior of my heart and life? Yes or no? We have to get our eyes off of ourselves. That's, that's where we get drawn into this gratification of sinful desires. Our eyes off ourselves and on to Jesus. The question then is, am I hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Well, that will happen only when Jesus is clearly and centrally in view. Not only will my desires begin to re be reformed, but then I'll begin to see others as I should. You know, as long as our hearts are losing the inner struggle, as long as we are pursuing the personal agenda of fulfilling our own private pleasures, Jesus will be out of sight and we will potentially be at war with one another. Now look at verse 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. There's only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? As we get the situation in our hearts squared away, as we begin to see others as we should, it becomes clear that we are brethren in Christ. We belong to the same family. We trust the same Savior. We are indwelt by the same Spirit. Why would we fight and quarrel with one another? If we are doers of the law, why would we fight and quarrel with one another? And what is that law? Well, back in chapter 2, James spoke of it as the royal law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself rather than judge your neighbor. Jesus said that the whole law and the prophets depend on loving God and loving your neighbor. As I am experiencing more of the love and grace of Christ and exhibiting that love and grace, there will be a corresponding de-escalation to the potential conflict that stands between you and I. Now, chapter breaks in Scripture are, are sometimes rather arbitrary. 
And there's really not a break between the end of chapter 3 and the beginning of chapter 4. And as chapter 3 ends, it, it, it mentions the seed whose fruit is righteousness sown in peace by those who make peace. And James says such people are peaceable. Will we be peacemakers with a renewed heart rather than warmongers attacking one another? Now, there is yet, according to James, another problem with our pleasures. He further says, you ask. Rather than you do not have because you do not ask, you do ask. Oh, well, maybe now we're on the right track. Ask God. Prayer. How can we go wrong here? Despite praying to God, James says, you do not receive. You do not receive? Oh, come on. Really? How is this any better than not having because I don't ask? You know, it's not, is it? I'm in the same boat. If I'm doing the right thing, why am I getting the wrong result? What's the problem? James says you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on, here it comes, your pleasures. Now, wrong motives means diseased or sick. Here is sick prayer because it comes from a sick heart that is losing the inner battle. The word spend means to squander. It's the same word used to describe what the prodigal did with the father's inheritance, which he had received. He squandered it. See, it's all about self, my will, my pleasure. These are the very things James identified in verse 1, which are the source of quarrels and conflicts with others. Your heart, the state of your heart, also impacts your prayers. The level of your prayer life will always be a reflection of the level of your spiritual health and growth, the condition of your heart. Now, do you tend to approach prayer with an attitude that God's in the business of giving you whatever you want, whatever you ask? He's there to make you feel good, put, you know, just rubber stamp your life. Lord, give me what I want, when I want it, when I ask for it, right now. You know, you treat him like Santa Claus. Well, God uh, is not to be and will not be manipulated by those kinds of prayers. They're futile. It all comes down to your motives. You know, there are two ways to pray. Thy will be done and my will be done. And those are the only two ways to pray. That's it. And what does each of those ways to pray say about your motives? The purpose of prayer is to get God's will done on earth not my will done in heaven. And is there a way that unanswered prayer has a detrimental effect on uh, my relationship with others in the body of Christ? Can it interfere with my relationship to others in the body of Christ? Well, if my prayers are, are, are not answered, and if I get angry at God because of that, do I then project that anger outward onto uh, others around me? If I'm mad at God, I'm probably not going to be on the best of terms with those of the household of God. So it very definitely has an impact. But what's to be done? Well, here again, we have to get uh, our hearts in order. We have to turn the tide of battle here. Jesus needs a firm grip in our hearts. That's always the priority. That impacts everything about us, including our pleasures and desires. David prayed, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever. See, the Lord doesn't want you to have a pleasureless life. He doesn't want to rob you of your joy. On the contrary, he wants your joy to be full. It's just not to be found in the gratification of your sinful desires. David again prayed, Lord, all my desire is before you. Oh, see, now it's... Thy will be done when it comes to desires. Putting those desires before the Lord. And then David again, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Reformed desires, realigned desires are the key to that fullness of joy. Quarrels and conflicts and unanswered prayer, two problems, two big problems with misguided pleasures. They are not, however, insurmountable problems if we will give King Jesus the control of our hearts and lives. 
Now, there was a past practice in uh, churches uh, years ago known as the mourner's bench. And maybe, maybe some of you, if you go back far enough, had an encounter with that at some point. Uh, it was sometimes uh, called uh, the anxious bench. And this would be a bench at the front of the church or maybe in front of the pulpit where uh, those of a repentant heart and mind could go and confess their sins and pray and ask the Lord to forgive those sins. And it played, it played a vital role in many revivals of a bygone era. Now, there's, of course, no virtue in a bench or an altar, uh, no matter what name it's called. But those who are in the grip of sin still need a place to go in a spirit of repentance where they can confess their sins and lay those sins before the throne of grace and throw themselves on the mercy of God. Well, the Lord's Supper does not its, itself impart the forgiveness of sins, but it is that time and place w- which we have been given to come before the Lord in repentance to confess our sins and seek the mercy of God to find refreshment in the cleansing blood of Christ. This is the time and place for us to come before the throne of grace to address that priority in our life, our heart's condition, to get our hearts sorted out and squared away before the Lord. He's given us this opportunity each week as we come together in his name. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I I would just ask that that each of us here would come this morning humbly before you, laying at the throne of grace those those things that may uh, be preventing us from walking fully in the light of your grace. Uh, Father, uh, humble us in this moment and renew us. And as we come before you with a repentant attitude, Father, we just pray that you will uh, not only forgive us, but cleanse us so that this week as we go out, we can let your holy light shine through our hearts and lives. Father, make a difference in us as our hearts are constantly realigned with you, that Jesus is Lord of our hearts, that he is king of our lives, and that we are living that reality for this world to see. Father, we thank you for Christ's sacrifice. We thank you for his new life and the forgiveness that he constantly washes over us because of his blood. And it's in his name we pray.
Thank you for that message, John. <clears throat> and praise God for his word, as we've seen David so many times in the Psalms. You know, I think there's a reason why he prayed this in Psalm 139, 23, 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting because David knew. He knew that only God knows the condition of our hearts and David knew from experience what he truly and what you and I are truly capable of and why we need Jesus. So uh, please rise and we'll continue in worship today. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. It's Psalm 99. Verse 9. Thy works 
shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Father, you are holy, and you are worthy, and we thank you, Father, for revealing yourself to us. We thank you, Lord, for making yourself known, for giving us the knowledge of your word, Lord, for leading us on the straight path, Father, and we just ask that you would search our hearts this week, and in the coming weeks, and in the coming months, and in the coming years, Lord, that we would never tire of your revelation, Lord, that you would continue to show us our need for you and your son, Jesus. Lord, uh, just make us ambassadors for your peace. Make us ambassadors for your love, Lord, as we go about the world today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed and have a wonderful week.